Okay, do you was here? So I think we should start. Uh, namaste, everyone. Good afternoon. Today we are having this 14th inter-hospital sharing. Uh, we have our guest, Professor Dr. Dhananjay Sharma, head of Department of Surgery from Government NSCB Medical College, Jabalpur, India, and he he will be delivering the presentation on lessons learned, what the textbooks don't teach you. So first, I'd like to start the introduction. I'm Dr. Uday Koyala uh, from Kathmandu Model Hospital, FECT. Uh, so. Hello, I'm Saros, Saros Detal. I'm Dr. Sharma, I'm very happy to be here. Namaste, I'm Nirajan Parajuli uh, from India. Namaste. Uh, I am Arvind Thakur from Manmohan Memorial Medical College and Teaching Hospital, Srambu. Okay, thank you. Manmohan. Next, Kathmandu Model Hospital. Namaste. I am Dr. Sunil Sakya from Kathmandu Model Hospital. Okay. Make it louder, right? Voice. Okay. Okay. Now that be general. Yes. Let us say something. Hmm. The Pasadik hours I had, he was, voice was too low. Namaste, my name is Daniel, I'm an elective student as well from Switzerland. Okay, from NAMS, I can see Professor Vishnu there. Hello, good afternoon. And I have my two dear medical oncology fellows, final year fellows, Dr. Ramila and Dr. <laughs> and from teaching IOM. Namaste, I'm Gunjan from IO IOM. Gunjan Matre, Ekle. Gunjan Ranjitkar from IOM. प्लीज from everyone i hope i am audible and uh, vis visible as well i am not very familiar with uh, this tele network so i must confess to being a little overawed by the occasion so if you if you have any question in between feel free to interrupt uh, it is slightly philosophical topic uh, lessons learned which the textbooks don't teach you <coughs> not moving forward it is okay but bit of a lag there so i bring you greetings from uh, india uh, namaskar namaste we are uh, actually one nation divided by an international border which is actually not a border because we can cross easily so a lot of friendship and goodwill uh, I am very happy to be here, which I consider my second home. Uh, I bring you greetings from my medical college. Mirajan, it has to go there. Okay. I am exactly in the geographical center of the country, Jabalpur. That is exactly the center of the country. And we have our uh, passion for innovations for low-cost surgery. 
so that is what we do and i would like to share some of the lessons learned by me uh, we although we are the biggest medical school in central india as as everywhere else the resources are not enough my ward has 32 beds and at any given point of time we have 6 to 8 floor beds the record was when we had 76 patients in our ward and you can imagine two patients between two beds uh, the bottom is not seen mirajin the bottom is not seen but so busy we could not take a picture of the ward that day so what i would like to remind you is our mortality figure is 9 lakh people a year and we are still struggling with lot of infectious problems so we have almost 4000 patients dying a day with respiratory infections 2000 a day with diarrhea and we are still the tuberculosis capital of the world 1500 people dying every day so we should not forget this when i speak of lessons learned i cannot pretend that i am a surgeon i'll deal only with surgical diseases i'll forget about all these resource crunch and all these uh, ethos uh, the medical ethos of my country this is what i must not forget and that is why i always project this slide that the difficulties are opportunities something which was taught to us by the last surgeon to receive the nobel prize professor mari and it was an inscription on a plaque on his desk so we can take these as opportunities another lesson which we can learn is from another nobel laureate you can do research on what is interesting or what is important alan higer taught us this and then of course uh, one of my mentors i asked him how to manage when you are having research crunch uh, nobel laureate in chemistry he said the essence of science is not only to discover but to invent but above all to create we are not thinking outside the box enough we have to create science we don't only have to read and write we have to create new science and very pertinent advice so lesson number learn i will summarize in this slide i must take problems as challenges i must research as per my needs and i must create science then only i will i will be able to solve my problems so number one problem in our wards as probably you also have intra abdominal sepsis lot of cases of perforation peritonitis peptic perforation uh, enteric perforation when we want to prognosticate we want to use apache the blood gas and arterial ph analysis is not available because it is expensive so what to do so we struggled we scratched our head and one of our first publication was that arterial ph and oxygenation are not essential for this stratification this was published about 20 years ago in indian journal of gastroenterology which is one of the snootiest publication uh, journal in india they are very snooty uh, i i have uh, uh, some responsibility with them as a reviewer but i can tell you it is very very snooty journal so it was like a shot in the arm for us so we went ahead we kept on researching on the same topic and we finally simplified the scoring system by including only six very basic parameters age of the patient perforation operation interval heart rate systolic blood pressure serum creatinine and comorbid conditions very simple and we again published it and it's very simple economical Uh, scoring system, and we called it by our name of my alma mater. I called it Jabalpur scoring system. Instead of naming after myself, I paid respect to my alma mater and called it Jabalpur prognostic scoring system. Next problem, as I told you, uh, let it be, Nirajan. No, uh, it will be disturbing everybody if if they are not muted. the bottom bar is probably not going to go away sir another problem is typhoid perforation we continue to see about 50 typhoid perforations every year and when we try to repair lot of them end up with fecal fistulas icu care is not available tpn is not available so what to do uh, our mortality was around 30% but if a fistula formed you can see this patient if the fistula formed 100% patients died every patient it was 
the signature of the disease for our patients. We thought what to do. We thought over it long and hard and we started doing ileostomy in every patient. We made it a policy of the department that we will not repair, we will not resect, we will not do anastomosis. And it was even more pertinent because in the night, the surgery was being done by younger consultants and registrars and residents. Our mortality went down from less from 30 to less than 3%. Very simple idea, but which worked for us. And again, I'll tell you that we don't have stoma therapists. So we didn't know how to really manage these stomas. The patients started each other, each other. At any given point of time, we had four, five, six patients and they teach each other. They come back after three months for closure of stoma. So the expertise is there among the patients, which they are very happy to share and teach each other. I like to call this surgery a very important thing and I call it geographical surgery. So the lesson which I learned was, if you don't have ICU, what to do? So we kept the patients on Ambu. It may be a surprising sight for you that patient being maintained on Ambu uh, in the ward while waiting for a ventilator. So we did not have an ICU. I got my ICU after 10 years struggle only last month. So if I'll call my professor of medicine, he knows I'm calling to ask for a ventilator if it is available in their ICU. So instead of saying, what do you need? He will say, good morning, sir. Let me check if the ventilator is available. So we never gave up. And that was something which I want to tell you. This particular patient survived. Finally, we were able to get a ventilator. So don't give up. That was the second lesson which we learned. So considering the importance of patients, holy grail for surgeons for long has been uh, transplantation. That has been the holy grail cardiac transplantation, lung transplantation, multiple transplantation. For me, I am happy to look after this patient. If this patient survives, that is my holy grail. I am more than happy. So the next lesson which I learned was that I have to learn to see things from the perspective of people whose life we impact. I should not keep on fantasizing about doing uh, cardiac transplantation or some such fancy stuff which is a thing of dream for us. And I have to be proud of my research because even little things make a difference. Just the decision to convert a repair to a stoma and we started saving so many patients. So again, I'll quote a Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman, who was admired by all the other Nobel laureates. He was so smart. He was so good. And what he said was, the only problems which are worthwhile are those where you can really contribute. That is important to know. Don't keep on struggling where you are failing. Try to find a problem where you can really solve and where you can contribute. So that brings me to my next lesson. And this came from uh, Peter Medawar, the Nobel laureate in immunology in 1960. What he said about James Watson, who got the Nobel Prize in 62 for discovering the helical structure of the DNA. He said that Watson had one towering advantage over everybody else. In addition to being very clever, he had something important to be clever about. So what is important for me? For me, it is important to take care of my perforation patient. If I want to be smart and clever, I have to be clever about what I'm dealing with day in and day out. So that is what was important for us. So the lesson which I learned from all this was that I must develop an appropriate technology. What is appropriate technology, which is need-based, which is available at grassroots, which is affordable, which is easy to maintain. The technology must be transparent. It has to be understood by everybody. And I have to involve the local people in the co-creation, what we like to call skills. Somebody is asking question. Should I go on? Mute got you, right? Next lesson to learn was whenever technology is unaffordable, you innovate. Now, innovation has different connotations in different places. For me, innovation means it leads to a quantum change. Immediately, you will be able to jump over all the obstacles. That is my definition. And when we talk of innovation in the context of developing countries, it means that necessity plus creativity plus what is available. 
what is indigenous whatever is available you use and get the problem solved that is the definition of innovation in the developing country so you have to save money because money is limited resources are limited you constantly think of squeezing constantly think of optimizing your resources that is very crucial so i'll give you a simple example i have known many patient many uh, surgeons in the western world using a dermatome the dermatome cost 1 lakh rupees 1.5 lakh rupees while an ordinary knife skin grafting knife costs around 4500 rupees if you don't have this can you use this why not i know many people who are using a shaving blade for grafting there are many such examples if you want to have a skin measure skin measures are expensive the original one they will call 7 lakh rupees my plastic surgeon has come out with a simple measure which cost 7000 rupees and this is an idea which is there in the mind of many plastic surgeons i know you can devise your own measure there is not something which is very important if you are going to have a light source for endoscopic surgery are you going to wait for xenon why not start with halogen start with halogen light source and get on with it if you are starting endoscopic surgery laparoscopic surgery do you really have to wait for uh, three chip camera why not start with single chip camera and i'll also give you one very simple idea which has worked for us the port closure needle they break often and in my department we struggled to get it again purchased from the government so what we have done we have devised a simple modified trocar just a trocar for inserting tube drain suction drain we cut a notch at the end of the trocar and you can easily hook up the thread very easy and free no charge if we talk of doing microscopic surgery the microscopes are expensive most of the plastic surgical procedures routine procedures they can be performed by loop and loops offer a comfort and easy access and may decrease the operating time and avoid purchasing complicated instrument if you have to purchase if you really 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 need a microscope which microscope do you want indigenous microscopes are so cheap even made in china are uh, not so expensive but if you are going to wait for carl zeiss from germany maybe you will be waiting all your life so don't wait up start and i'll give you a very simple idea about neurosurgery too the idea is when you are doing image guided neurosurgery commercial markers which are fiducials they cost 10000 rupees so you put them on the head of the patient and then you guide the surgery because they are radio opaque what many people don't know vitamin e tablets they are also radio opaque and they can be replaced by vitamin e tablets and you can save all this money so simple ideas which we can explore when resources are not there for us the orthopedic surgeons use external fixators the branded company they cost a lot you can get it made by local blacksmith which number of my orthopedic surgeons do and they are very happy with the result when we talk about the knee transplants or hip transplants again the international branded transplants uh, the prosthesis are very expensive and locally indigenous ones are very very economical so think about it so the lesson which i learned was no matter where you learn the art of stitching whether in the fashion house of paris or in the fashion house of milan no matter where you learn you have to cut the cloth according to the size of your customer so you you tell me i have received many awards uh, the bottom part of the slide is probably not very clear many people think it's a virtue that i have come out with so many modifications i tell them it's a necessity it's a compulsion so you have to cut the cloth according to the size of your customer so the next lesson was when you are going to innovate how do you do it you have to be curious you have to brainstorm for ideas because history of mankind is the history of ideas and none other than marie curie the only scientist who got the nobel prize in two different science subjects she told us this be less curious about people and more curious about ideas this is something which is very pertinent and when you are brainstorming for ideas it is crucial that you suspend where is the slide you
brainstorming for ideas don't be judgmental this morning in the morning class professor deetal said the same thing don't be judgmental if somebody is giving you a new idea let him speak let there be a hearing for him so don't be a devil's advocate and find faults in it be an angel's advocate look for the good ideas in that point and it is important then when you are thinking of innovation that you think with your right brain because left sided brain belongs to logic right sided brain belongs to imagination 2 plus 2 4 or 2 plus 2 22 it is up to you if you use the right side of your brain you can do whatever you want to do now the problem with new ideas is with any new idea is that the human mind treats it the same way body treats a antigen it rejects by forming antibodies just like you have a new i something foreign body body wants to reject you have to learn to overcome this this antibody reaction and again i quote the first nobel laureate from india guruji ravindranath tagore who said let noble thoughts come from all sides keep an open mind don't have mental blocks to new ideas keep an open mind let the new ideas come from everywhere so what happens how do we apply these ideas we have so many peptic perforations about 5 to 10% of them they leak again we have no tpn momentum is not available because it is already utilized by the previous surgery so we were chatting about it with our colleagues and the plastic surgeon came out with the idea that why not use the rectus abdominis muscle it is right next door and it has a robust blood supply so we took the flap of rectus abdominis stitched it to the side of the duodenal fistula i call it my surgical parachute because this i have to use when nothing else is available now the problem with this surgery was my residents were not able to do it because the suturing part right near the liver upper and right quadrant was very difficult so we simplified this operation we asked the anesthetist to push the rail tube through the fistula we tied the flap to the rail tube and then the anesthetist pulled the rail tube so it went and fitted in the fistula very easily and we just sutured around it very easy technique ramp pull in or ramp two as we call it we have lot of patients of uh, carcinoma esophagus and because we did not have ventilators we were forced to do transatlial esophagectomy when i will put my hand in transatlial to dissect the middle third of esophagus my hand will compress the heart and the anesthetist will start shouting take your hand out the blood pressure is falling so one of my residents a uh, very bright chap he came out with the idea of a stripper and he was after me let us try this let us try this so we tried this stripper in the post mortem and we were able to strip the whole of the esophagus from the neck in less than 1 minute and we opened the chest we found the zygotes were not damaged the tracheobronchial tree safe so we have been doing it for last many years more than 200 cases we have done very simple idea we continue to evolve such ideas and when staplers are not available and you have to do a very low anterior resection very low in female patients we borrowed the idea from our pediatric surgeon and what he suggested why not make use of a perineal incision deliver the rectum from there finish the mesorectal excision from below and do the anastomosis and revision again a very simple idea i owe it to my pediatric surgeon so when we started doing laparoscopic surgery we were not very good with suturing so we wanted to use endoloop sutures which were expensive so we went back to the basics and we learned from the art of tatting are you aware of the word tatting tatting means lace making lace making so i have a very smart uh, lady doctor with me she remembered this technique and she could tie this knot very easy which we have published simple technique based on tatting similarly we are worried about since so many laparotomies are being done incisional hernia rate is unacceptable lot of these emergency laparotomies are done so we came out again with the idea of herring bone suturing of the rectus sheath we compared the physics of the herring bone suture with a simple suture it is much stronger according to physics principle also and our incisional hernia rate came down to 1.3% from earlier 10% i am talking about only one year period so simple thing to learn ego means you will not learn 
Einstein told us the more the knowledge, lesser the ego, lesser the knowledge, more the ego. We have to understand this. So what do you, how do you deal with pride? When I talk of pride, it is the most serious of seven deadly sins. It is not pride, it is arrogance. And this morning also we were discussing, arrogance is when you think that only you are good. Pride is when you think you are good. That is okay. It is okay to be proud, but it is not okay to be arrogant, not fair. So the lesson learned from a Nobel laureate in physics in 1947 that it is possible for a person to feel both humble and proud at the same time. Be proud, but be humble also. Humble because so many people have contributed to your success right from your childhood, your mother, your school teachers, primary, middle school, high school, and pride because pride is what makes you to drive for excellence. That is crucial. And again, this advice I got from my friend and mentor, Professor Jake, who was the president of the European Surgical Association. And we often spoke about this and he wrote a beautiful editorial, Ambition and Humility of the Surgeons. When you start operating, patients get well, it is very easy to become egotistical but it hurts you in the long run. So it is good to be have ambitious, but good to be having humility. So this slide will tell you the self-esteem is good. Good, but not too much, not too much. Humility conquers the pride. That is important to remember. Not too much of self-esteem. So the next lesson, when you have so many ideas, you must recognize a good idea because opportunity favors a prepared mind. Otherwise your idea, while you are thinking about it, somebody else will publish. Uh, this is one of my mistakes, which I share in every lecture. Every lecture. Uh, we have... Can you remove the dialogue box? mistake which I made was we have many patients of submucous fibrosis. So in one of the conferences, I met another colleague from another medical university and I asked him what is latest which you have published. He told me that I have published a new mouth guard. It is not progressing. Mm. Okay. So he told me that he has published a new mouth guard for endoscopic examination of patients with oral submucous fibrosis. I said, what is it? He said, it is the cut end of the syringe. So opportunity favors a prepared mind. One has to be ready. If you come out with a new idea, you should be able to understand that it's a good idea and you should be able to deal with it. Now, another operation in which we were able to succeed was bypass for cancer esophagus. Earlier, when these cheap economical stents were not there, we were still doing bypass surgery. So in one of the patients, I opened the chest. It was before the era of the CT scans. I found that the cancer was fixed to the tracheobronchial tree. It was fixed to the right bronchus. So I started doing what is known as Kishner operation. And I found I could mobilize the fundus of the stomach without disarticulating the esophagus cardiac junction. So a new operation. This time I was smart. This patient survived for close to two years. She could do two chapatis every day because part of the fundus had gone up. But this time I was smart and I was able to publish it as the first report in the world. So lesson which I learned was that you have to master the technique by mastering the basics. You have to know history of surgery. You have to know the logic the philosophy, the anatomy, the physiology, pathology, everything you have to master. And if you don't read, you know what happens. Can you see? OD cannot open the door because he doesn't know how to read. He's pushing when he should be pulling. So you have to read and know everything about it. That is why I published a book on GI surgery and gastroenterology in India more than 20, 25 years ago. Because I remember Bill Roth said that only the man who is familiar with the art and science of the past is competent to aid in its progress in the future. And the common aphorism is, if you don't remember your history, you are condemned to repeat it. 
you will make the same mistakes again and again, which already our predecessors have done. So you have to know history. So number of surgical procedures have been discarded for giant duodenal perforation. Some of the senior professors will remember that you can make a plug of omentum. It works. Very simple technique, free omental plug, just like a mushroom, it works. Another thing which was discarded is the, if you don't have staplers, how do you do lower one third cancer rectum? I told you once procedure in female patients, I will tell you the in male patients. What you can do is you can approach the posterior approach to rectum. If there is an anterior resection, that means there must have been a posterior resection also. So in the past, they used to give an incision in the back between the sacrum and the coccyx. You excise the coccyx, incise the fascia, rectum is right in front of you. And you can do a under vision anastomosis. Only thing is patient has to be changed in position. So that is the only drawback. So I will continue in the same vein of thought. I'll talk about, again, staplers are not available. How do you devascularize for portal hypertension? You will think that it is common that you can do endoscopic sclerotherapy or endoscopic varicell ligation. What happens when this fails? Devascularization is the only option. And we devised a simple technique for devascularization based on surgical anatomy. Hmm. What it means is you can give transmural sutures. If the aim is obliteration of varices, you don't need staplers. You just isolate the esophagus and with the rice tube as guide, you can give transmural sutures, two layers of sutures, interrupted sutures and modified technique works for everybody. And you can do it even at a district hospital. If you don't have endoscopes, how do you predict whether the patient's hematemesis is because of the portal hypertension? If you remember your physiology, it is the difference between serum ascites and uh, uh, Albumin difference between serum and uh, ascitic fluid. Greater the difference, more chances are that it will be portal hypertension. A very simple thing which is given in the book of physiology. So you might consider all these ideas are very small trifles. But trifles make perfection and perfection is no trifle. This simple message came from Michelangelo who painted the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Very simple things. So I always teach when you spend time on small things, what everybody likes to call trifles, when you are spending time on small things, you are actually practicing excellence. You remember how you learned how to tie the knots. You tied it all the time. Practice, practice, practice. So trifles make perfection and perfection is no trifle. So the lesson which I learned was I have to look for simple solution. Use science rather than unaffordable technology because science and technology are the two sides of the same coin. Technology is expensive because it is commercially driven. Science is universally available to everybody, everybody. So since we do so many stoma procedures, stoma care is expensive. So this patient comes to me with such a beautiful skin around the stoma. You can see bright skin, no excoriation. I asked him, what are you using? He said, I'm using linseed oil. I understand it is called Arandika tel, alsika tel, in alsika tel. So alsika tel is used very commonly in villages. We know about its medicinal property. I did not know that linseed oil has medicinal property. When I looked up in Google and on other resources, I came to know that every civilization in the history of mankind has used linseed oil. I did not know. And you'll be surprised to know, like I was, that the word liniment comes from linseed oil. So we have been using this from uh, that time. It is very, very cheap, very economical. And this is probably known to you for mesh hernioplasty. If mesh is not expensive, you can use an ordinary nylon mosquito net. Very, very economical. Doesn't cost anything. We published it long time ago. For, hello, hello. For blood transfusion, commercial equipment for cell separation is very expensive. We thought, why not make use of the whole blood? Very, very, very simple. Very simple. Auto transfusion equipment. 
we use an ordinary drainage bag just use the bag to drain the blood from hemothorax or hemoperitoneum and just turn the bag upside down and you can transfuse you can see in the picture we have recently published it in asian journal of surgery very simple idea the cost is not even 200 rupees so the motto of my department is modify simplify and apply don't complicate things that is the main reason okam's razor okam was a philosopher 500 years ago who told us if there are many explanations of any phenomena the simplest explanation would be the correct one so we stick to okam's razor and we go back to our favorite nobel laureate einstein who said when solution is simple god is answering our prayers very simple thing to remember and leonardo da vinci he said the same thing that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication simple ideas will always win always always the next lesson i came to was we read all the western textbooks we read their literature i must validate those ideas in my own setup and what i like to call geographical publications when we started looking at it we found that our anatomy is different our lymph node counts are different because when we talk of cancer surgery it's always about the number of lymph nodes you remove our lymph nodes count are different when i thought of applying the trauma scoring systems the trauma scoring systems need modification because our patients reach the hospital late so sc trauma scoring systems have to be different we go on okay okay so you know about posam when you audit your research when you audit your research it is by posam so we realize that our patient population is different so we uh, that's okay that's okay that's okay. Uh, see you okay that's okay so we call it jabalpur posam we have our own audit system like everything else i call it jabalpur posam posam so different system for different sub population of patients so the lesson i learned was i must provide training as per my students needs what i like to call geographical surgery geographical training i have to ensure can he or she work against odds that is very crucial i will illustrate this example by a report published 10 years ago in times of india a hospital about 100 kilometers from melbourne a child fell down and he went to the hospital and they realized clinically that he had an extradural hematoma they did not have neurosurgery instrument so the anesthetist checked with the neurosurgeon in melbourne and the surgeon used an ordinary carpenter drill to make a hole in the bar hole in the tympanic bone and the child survived this is what i want from my post graduates this is what we did this is the attitude if you think you can do it you can do it if you think you cannot do it you cannot do it so this is the technology deprived attitude which i have to teach and the surgeon as a prognostic factor is well known when we talk of lymphadenectomy when we talk of high volume center what i need is a thinking surgeon person who can think while struggling against odds that is what i have to teach and that is what i preach the next lesson which i learned was that we are standing on the shoulders of the giants kya karu fir se push karu wait it is from giants we are all standing on the shoulders of our predecessors and giants so i was very fortunate in 1990 i attended a international conference in delhi where i met professor hopsley professor nehas and professor kandol professor hopsley i asked him he was born in kolkata i don't know if you know this or not and he had a soft corner for uh, southeast asian surgeons i asked him how can i do peptic culture research when i don't have an endoscope when i don't have anything no expensive laboratory he said once you operate on the peptic culture patient measure the weight and measure the triceps skin fold thickness that is more than enough professor nias had just published his classification of inguinal hernias just published and we were 
so fond of listening to him at the end of his lecture all of us surrounded him and he gave us 30 minutes extra to explain his classification systems i have never met a more generous and more elegant person he gave us so much time he was such a big professor so i learned that i have to be patient when my students ask me questions professor condon taught me something uh, something which i didn't want to learn actually he taught me when i asked him a question he was very rude to me very rude so i realized that if some young person asks you a question don't dismiss him outright and it was shocking for me to know that such a big surgeon such a big professor he was so dismissive of a question asked by me so again something i learned from them from professor legate who was a professor for my son when he was an intern with him i asked him what message you have for me so he taught me that you have to take your teaching as seriously as you take your research because if you look at the lower graphic teaching actually means learning and in our own hamari sanskriti mein in our own culture we teach vidya baatne se vidya badhti hai so this is what everybody knows and we have to remember this a good lesson to learn then as a teacher it is important to realize that you have to be good mentor because success means number of successors and jonas sak who was the pioneer of first polio vaccine he called it as good ancestors so my trainees they are my descendants i am their ancestor because they carry my surgical dna very important thing to remember we also have to remember the difference between a boss and a leader you can see the boss up is pushing while the leader is pulling and participating in everything as he should because we must become the change we want to see that is very crucial so the lesson i learned was i have to be a good teacher i have to be a good leader i have to be a good mentor very easy things to in theory but sometimes difficult in practice another lesson which i learned was that equality does not mean justice number of my students and patients come from very very modest backgrounds very poor backgrounds they never complain they never complain so i have to do justice to them equality will not do because they never complain they don't have the tongue in their mouth in india we say garib ke muh mein zuban nahi hoti to garib student garib marij they will never complain you have to read their complaint in their eyes and make sure they get justice so the next lesson is don't give up learn from your failures because failures will be there at every corner in your career there are many mistakes so i'll quote my favorite scientist from the last century who was the inventor of the last century he invented the light bulb after 1000 attempts and his friends used to rag him that you have failed 1000 times and what he replied was i have not failed i have learned so much i know 1000 ways by which a light bulb does not work so today you have given me an opportunity to speak so i have shared some of my successful ideas because the list of failures is too long it will take two days too many failures but i made sure i learned from each one of them if you really look at the graph of success what people think it looks like on the left side that is what people think it looks like on the right side what it really is so many mistakes so many failures you keep on learning keep on pushing finally if you are lucky you succeed so coming to the close you have to be knowledgeable as well as wise about 20 years ago i published a book called debates in gastrointestinal surgery in which there were many options and we tried to discuss which option would be the correct one in which patient so wisdom by reflection is the noblest way you think and become wise most of us they we learn by the bitterest way by making many mistakes the easiest way to, is to copy you copy your professor you copy your senior but remember that is not true wisdom so i'll share the ecg of knowledge ecg of knowledge is means p is initial theory something new 
Q is the initial skepticism, R there is an enthusiasm for a new thing, then they realize it has number of limitations and complications. So T wave, little bit of learning. So you start with knowledge, you end with wisdom. I'm very grateful to one of my mentors, Professor McLeish, a former president of Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, who taught me this wise thing. So next lesson, publish or perish. This was what was taught to me. And I always teach, jungle mein mor nacha kisne dekha. The peacock dances so beautifully in the forest, nobody sees. So what I now teach is publish and prosper. You can prosper by publishing. It's very easy. Publish, 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 wherever they'll accept your paper. Wherever, journal articles, wherever they'll take. Book chapters. Once you start writing many book authors will ask you for book chapters. You can write your own books. So get the word out, publish articles, books, book chapters, go on publishing. It will lead to all types of academic achievements. You will start getting orations. You will start getting all types of awards everywhere. That is the currency of the academic world. And then the best thing which happens to you, peer recognition, visiting fellowship, visiting professorships. I, as you can see, I am with some of the topmost surgeons in the world who were kind enough to help me in my career. Professor Bloomgard, Professor Lonwa, Professor Maruyama who devised the D2 gastrectomy, Professor Makuchi who is the father of liver transplant in Japan, so many of them. And I learned many things from them. I was very fortunate to meet Professor Schwartz. All of us read his textbook of surgery. And when I visited him, he gave me a copy of his latest book. It weighs something like two kilograms. And he gave me the copy. It was like this. He said, don't worry, Professor Sharma. I'll send it by post. You don't have to carry it and pay extra in your airline baggage. Then I made friends with Professor O'Connell, who is the editor of Love and Bailey. And he came and spent five days with me a couple of years ago in Jabalpur. And again, he gave me a copy of his book. So, so many honors and awards, honorary fellowship of Royal College of Surgeons of Thailand, honorary membership of French Academy of Surgeons, then on adundum and honorary fellowship of all the four Royal College of Surgeons of England and Ireland. All because of these publications, these successful ideas on low cost surgery. I have so many visiting professorships, so many over the world, more than 20 countries. What I finally learned was that everybody speaks about value for money. You want to buy a cell phone, you want value for money. We have to think of value for money because millions of people survive on less than 100, 200 rupees a day. We have to do research for them and then only it will be a true inclusive research. That is very important to remember. In fact, this is our obligation. This is our duty because we are talented. We have to be honorable and generous towards those who are less privileged than us. And how? Gracefully, without being patronizing, without being condescending, because to lead is to serve. Only then you are a leader. You are, if you are a ruler, you are not a real leader. So this is, I think, my final slide. Equitable health for everyone is unfinished business of democracy. We can only do it by joining our hands together. If we join our hands together, then only we can solve these problems. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Any question or someone you can raise your hand and we'll ask. Give you the chance. Questions or comments? We highly appreciate the talk because. Uh, Introduction. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm a professor Vishnu Paul, the program director of GM Medical Oncology and National Academy of Medical Science, Bihar. And your talk is very highlighting. 
very encouraging because it is not only the data, it is the ideas, it's the values, it's the humanity that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should, if we all should follow the philosophy which you're talking, this world will be a beautiful place. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Chitis, you have also been doing so much of innovations in your own way. So maybe you have got something to say something to ask to Professor Sharma or share your experience in brief. Chitis. Um, my name is Chitis. Um, I work at Am People Hospital. Um, it's, it's a small rural hospital, about six hours drive from Kathmandu. And I'm here with my students and medical officers to listen to your lecture. It's really inspiring. Um, and it's really a, a, a very a good opportunity for us to learn. And uh, I think uh, stay motivated and inspired. Well, I haven't done much. I've just done a few things. Uh, uh, that linseed oil thing, if I knew at that time, probably uh, that would have helped me as well because we had a patient here uh, and that I did an emergency number to me and then did an um, eyeless to me to save the patient's life. Uh, so at the time what we did was... Um, we had about 10 or 15 uh, stoma bags uh, that were left by Mason Hospital. Um, and we quickly ran out of it. And then we started using plastic bags and all and whatnot. Um, ultimately, what we did was um, uh, we, we break the uh, um, mattress and made a gutter in between. Um, uh, so um, there, and I put a kidney tray there, and then asked the patient to lie supine or lie on the side, so that the content would directly go into the kidney tray. And in the nighttime, we would put bags and all. And most of the time, when he was talking with other fellow patients, um, so he would be lying on his side like that or like on supine, and all the content would directly go into the kidney tray, and and um, that was put uh, in, in, in a gutter that's between, between two mattresses. Well, actually, uh, one mattress is called upside on the top, and the other uh, is, is like that. So that's, that's how we did. Uh, at that time, I had no idea that I could use linseed. And also, um, I've been using syringes for uh, splints, for finger splints. Uh, we have this, uh, um, like, you know, this uh, ligament injuries and all, and we may not have all this kind of fancy things and all. So I take huge syringes, 10 ml syringes, 20 ml syringes, and cut it longitudinally and make it into two splints, and so that you can put the finger on it. So that could be used as a finger split as well. And I have used um, these uh, plastic... Um, uh, uh, the IV fluids bottles uh, as a spacer and mask for kids and for, uh, for uh, adults as well, uh, for whom you need to give salbutamol MDIs and other things that they cannot do a hand mouth coordination properly. And those patients, you cut one piece in uh, one bottle into a small uh, uh, mask, and the other would be uh, attached to it as a spacer. And at the bottom of the bottle, uh, to use as a spacer, you can you make a hole and put a MDI into it, and then you just give a couple of pops into it, and you can uh, you can use that as a spacer as mask. And that actually that has helped uh, reduce uh, readmission rates uh, for some kids around here. So those are the few. Yeah, very good. So so this was just you know to to demonstrate that you know our. You know, we have got a very special genre of doctors who are working in remote areas. And uh, <clears throat> the doctor just uh, who talked to us, she is, is working in our people, which, which is not actually very far away from.
relatively well established hospital that was established by the Christian missionaries in the past. And uh, Chidi's, uh, at some point of time, he was working with us. And we hear that many you know, similar things are being done in remote areas like Dulu. Uh, Dr. Puza is there, right? From Dulu Hospital. Do, do you have anything to say to Professor Sharma? Microphone. इनोवेशन भाई the thing that I wanted to say, as I've already written on the group chat, it was very inspiring. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was very much motivating. And one thing uh, that has uh, like, uh, touched me is that you uh, not only should work, but also should make your work be seen by everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, Andrew, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nizina? Do you have anything to say? Yeah, inspiring and very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's not uh, directly related to all this presentation. It's uh, just a philosophical question, I think. Uh, uh, the things that you are doing there and all this kind of low-tech low surgery and all these things, why are you doing what you are doing? What is, what is the reason behind this? Mm. <clears throat> very, very simple to answer because I did not have any other option. <laughs> the patient required me to modify things. So that is what we did. Mm. Then why, why um, uh, try for rec recognition? Like why publish it? You just uh, keep on doing your work. I mean, why do why you encourage us to publish the thing? If you just, uh, if you, if you are just trying to uh, solve the problem and you solve the problem and you, you provided the care to your patients, why uh, publish it? Ah, okay, okay. Another very simple question to answer. Any science experiment which you have conducted, unless it is accepted by your peers, your work is incomplete. You cannot say that I will do this. It works for me. It has to be replicable. It has to be duplicated. It has to be understood. It has to be accepted by your scientific peers. First is you have a hypothesis. Second, you conduct the experiment. Third is acceptance and publication of, in the form of uh, acceptance by all your peers. Okay. Science is incomplete without publication. Please remember this. At least, you know, if you, uh, if you are not too much, you know, if you are not very keen in publishing what you have done, for your own ego satisfaction. Don't do that, but you know, take it as an opportunity for sharing. You have got some good results, and if that can be replicated by somebody else, you know, isn't that wonderful? So one thing is that at one level, you have already practiced your compassion, and by sharing it with others, you know, that is an act of love where you are providing others with the same opportunity for, you know. And, and, and the benefit of your idea is available to everybody through the internet now. I have shown you my web page, all our publications, all our ideas, successful ones, they are on the web page. Anybody can download. So maybe our patient benefited. One day you may be in such a difficulty. You can give the benefit, pass on the benefit to your patients too. That makes sense. 
Yeah, this is the first time in my 38 years I have been asked why do I published. <laughs> <laughs> but he is very special. No, I have to ask you why don't you publish? That should be the question. <laughs> Not that why I publish. Everyone has to publish. See, your ideas have to benefit as many patients as possible. That is why you publish. Okay. Yeah, I think my ideas are too simple and it's already been published. That's why I don't publish. <laughs> no, 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 no. You publish your results. They are more than 100,000 journals. You publish your results. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the encouragement. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes, there are some messages like from Dr. Satish Nirola. He has texted managed to join from mid of the presentation, honor to have heard from great personality. And Arvin, he joined from home with my lunch with me. Very enlightening talk. Thank you, and then for bringing such a personality and such ideas to our phones. Okay. I'm... Yeah, that is already there. Already there. <laughs> Sorry for being late. Really, I miss the uh, previous one. Uh, okay. Comments. Okay. So I will I will again tell you, friends, that I am very happy to be here. I came to assist Professor Saroj Bital and uh, Mahavirji. I am very happy, and I my trip has been very fulfilling, very very emotionally fulfilling and spiritually fulfilling. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone. So, Professor Bishop. Already told, this was a, it is a very different type of talk. We have been always talking about only science, data, and the figures one day. But this is something coming from the heart. So, that's very important. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. In this presentation certainly benefited from your breadth of knowledge and depth of expertise, giving it your time really helped to make it a success. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. It was a nice talk and we just, everyone benefited from this. So we'll continue to have this type of session again. Thank you. <laughs>